So welcome to the Free Library of Philadelphia. My name is Cynthia Schemmer, and I'm honored to introduce our guests this evening. Praised as a master of narrative journalism by the New York Times, Mark Bowden is the author of 13 books, including Black Hawk Down, which was adapted as a motion picture and received two Academy Awards. He was a staff writer at the Philadelphia, Philadelphia Inquirer from 1979 to 2003, and is currently a national correspondent for The Atlantic. Tonight's featured book, The Last Stone, has been heralded by NPR as a riveting serpentine story about the dogged pursuit of the truth, regardless of the outcome or the cost. In a world currently cluttered with true crime narratives, Mark does due diligence to a cold case that he covered over 40 years ago, and he writes the recent conclusion with meticulous documentation and tenacious storytelling. Joining Mark tonight is Catherine Recker, who has been a criminal defense attorney for nearly 30 years. Her clients range from individuals, corporations, educational and religious institutions, executives of publicly traded companies, and to mafia figures. Much of her work is international in scope, involving investigations into public corruption, antitrust violations, violations of US trade embargoes involving Cuba and Iran, and bribery of foreign officials in Europe, Central Europe, Russia, Asia, and the Middle East. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Catherine Recker and Mark Bowden to the Free Library. So Mark, the last stone. <laughs> You've said that anyone old enough in Washington, D.C. metro area immediately knows what you're talking about if you mention the Lion Sisters. Right. Tell us about the Lion Sisters and your first exposure to the case. Well, you know, in 1975, before the advent of the internet and cable TV networks, uh, stories like this one were primarily regional. And this was a big one. This was Virginia, Maryland, Washington, D.C., and, and it was such a huge story, as I said, if you run into anyone old enough and ask them about the Lion Sisters, they know about this terrible case. I was a young reporter, 23 years old, at the Baltimore News American, and my job was to come into the newsroom every morning at 4 o'clock and call every police barracks in the state and ask them if anything had happened overnight. And 99.9% .9 of the times the answer was no, even if something had actually happened. Uh, and, uh, but in this case, this was March 25th, and I think it was probably March 26th of 1975, but I called the, the Wheaton, Maryland uh, Police Department there, and uh, they said, yeah, we've, we've lost these two little girls. So, um, you know, my job, it was an afternoon newspaper, was if anything had happened of note, <coughs> was to drive to the scene and then start reporting. And because it was an afternoon newspaper, if I moved fast enough, we could get a story in the paper that day. So I drove down there, and I ended up spending two weeks or more covering this story, which was the first big news story that I ever covered, first front page stories that I ever wrote. And um, they never found these girls. So it just remained a tragedy and, and a mystery. So, um... 38 years later, what compelled or what prompted the Montgomery County Police Department to reopen this cold case that had no crime scene and no bodies? Well, they had never forgotten it. And this is one of the most remarkable things about this story is that for 40 years, the Montgomery County Police never stopped investigating. And uh, there was one detective, Ed Golian, who had been a um, cadet at the time this happened. And so before he was even officially a member of the department, he had been uh, put to, to work with all the other cadets searching fields. They would march across fields arm lengths apart looking for traces of these missing girls. He spent his entire career as a detective and as he was getting ready to retire, he went to work in the cold case unit and reinvestigated the Lyons sisters case and never found anything. So there were generations of detectives in that department who uh, reviewed and never really forgot this case. Another important thing is that one of the girl's brothers joined the Montgomery County Police Department. So this became kind of a family thing for that department. So they never forgot it. Um, what happened in 20, 
I think it was 2013, um, is that one of the detectives, Chris Homrock, of the uh, cold case unit there was, like many before him, uh, had invested himself for years into reinvestigating the Lion sisters' disappearance and had formulated a very strong conviction that the person responsible was this known child molester who had since died named Ray Molesky. He was convinced that his man was Ray Molesky and he was um, reviewing for the umpteenth time the case files and he came across this statement by an 18-year-old witness named Lloyd Welsh who said that he had witnessed a man taking the two girls from the mall and that the man walked with a limp. Well, Ray Molesky walked with a limp. So Chris thought, aha, you know, I may have an eyewitness who can confirm that this was Ray Molesky. Who is this Lloyd Welsh and where is he? And so that's what led them to hunt down Lloyd, who was then 40 years later in prison in Delaware, serving a sentence, a long sentence for child molestation, which rang a bell all of a sudden. And so now they're thinking, maybe this guy wasn't just a witness. So they went down to Smyrna, Delaware and started interviewing Lloyd. So much of the book, actually, I would say the predominant um, part about the book that I really was was found gripping is that it was an exploration of the conflict between um, self-preservation and the urge to confess. Yeah. Um, and it's interesting because Ray Molesky and Lloyd Welch both voluntarily inserted themselves into the investigation. Yeah. Um, do you have any insights about why? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I think in Lloyd's case, what I came to believe is that he did kidnap and kill these girls. It had become such a huge story in um, his neighborhood and you know, where he was living. He had to fear that someone had seen him, um, that he was going to somehow be linked and get caught. And so he cooked up the idea of going to the police and trying to tell them a story that would lead them in the wrong direction. And that's what he did. And he failed in his effort because they saw right through him. They could tell that he was lying. They could tell that he was high. Uh, they wrote right on top of his statement, which went in the file, lied. <laughs> and so that was one reason why they didn't take him seriously. Uh, but, you know, I know there are these, these theories that the perpetrators of these crimes can't help themselves, you know, that they want to, they want someone to pay attention to them. And there may be some truth to that, because certainly, as you mentioned, Katie, um, years later, when all Lloyd had to do to protect himself was shut up. He kept talking, he kept and, talking, talking and, and talking and talking and talking. And talking. <laughs> hence, hence the story that I have to tell. And this would be of particular interest to you, because you, you defend people who have been charged with crimes, and so you must come across some of this yourself. Even I find, as a journalist, that people love to talk about themselves. And if you sit down with someone and start interviewing them, people love to tell their stories, even when their stories are not necessarily in their best interest. Do you find the same thing? Well, I think that I would say just about 99% of my clients think if they just get that opportunity to speak to the prosecutor, they can fix everything. They yeah. can explain it. And you're telling them, no. <laughs> and if I had been anywhere near Lloyd Welch, I would have said, absolutely not. You are going to do nothing but hurt yourself. And that's exactly what happened. Right. But Lloyd, who knew he was guilty, that he had done this, um, was afraid that the detectives knew more. He needed to know how much they knew. And his method of protecting himself is to spin a, fabricate another story. That's his modus operandi. So for him in prison to defend himself, he needs to sit down and keep talking to these detectives to find out what they know. And every time they tell him something that they've learned, he has to adjust his story and he ends up telling a completely different tale. But ultimately, he told enough of, of the truth to lead the detectives yeah. 
to probably what is as close to the real story as yeah. anyone is ever going to know. Not on purpose, though, because Lloyd never stopped lying. And he's still lying. I went to see him in prison, and he lied to me. Uh, <laughs> but what the detectives learned, and as Dave Davis, one of the detectives, told me, people, when they lie, they lie about the big things, but they flesh out the lies with the truth. And so there were elements to the ever-changing stories that Lloyd told, which kept recurring. Like if he had been in a car, asked to describe the car, the car description would be the same in version one, two, and three, even though the stories themselves were completely different. Asked to describe where the girls were being held after they kidnapped. Every time he told the story, it was in a different place. But the description of the room and how you could only get to it by walking around to the backyard and entering through a door uh, into the basement uh, was the same in all of those stories. So they learned to extract the nuggets of truth from all the lies. I think you said in the book that the, the key to figuring out what he was saying is to forget the narrative, right. but just focus on the details. Exactly. Um, so tell us a little bit about the detectives who so skillfully focused on the details and figured it out. Well, I, I got to the point where I really liked them. Um, you know, Dave Davis and Katie Leggett and Mark Janney were the three primary interrogators. And, you know, in movies, the expert interrogators show up and they know exactly what to do and they have all the right moves and tactics, you know, in questioning people. And Katie and Mark and, and Dave were experienced detectives, but they had never conducted an interrogation of this duration or intensity. And they were feeling their way in. And if you, if you read about them, you see them making mistakes, um, really wrestling with uh, how to take the next step, how to, when they got stuck, you know, what can we do to get past this? How can we jar Lloyd into telling us something a little bit closer to the truth. So I think what they did is what smart people do, is they, they, were, they wrestled with the problem, they figured it out, and they did an amazing job. And I think the only way you can understand or appreciate it is to get in there in the room and, and listen and read and watch how they did it. So um, each of them had a different style. Do you think any one of their styles was more effective, less effective? Did it suit the individual, their personality? Yeah, I think the style of each of the detectives reflected who they were. Um, I can't really say that, I think maybe Dave was probably the most effective, but that's probably because he spent the most time. But um, Dave was, much to his distaste, Lloyd's buddy. You know, and, and this, though, I have to say, went well beyond the classic good cop, bad cop dynamic because this became a whole lot more complicated. But Dave was, if you had to describe it in a nutshell, he, was, he had managed to convince Lloyd that he was his pal and that he was really looking out for him. And in fact, Lloyd tells him at one point that I know you're a cop, but you have a good heart. You know, I think you're a good guy. Well, Dave was appalled by Lloyd. And as one of the other detectives said to me, Dave is very genuine, even when he's not being genuine. <laughs> so Dave knew what he was doing, and he was very skilled at it. Katie was someone who I think, for the most part, without much success, played on, tried to play on Lloyd's conscience. You know, trying to get him to feel the pain of the parents who had no idea what had happened to their little girls. Uh, trying to get to appeal to him emotionally, um, although Katie came up with a couple of ruses that ended up being very effective in sh shaking Lloyd up and getting him to talk. What, what were those? Well, one, the big one was he had a, a girlfriend back in the years that this happened, and she told Lloyd that the girlfriend had kept a diary. The girlfriend had died s some years earlier, but he, she told him that Helen had kept a diary during all those years with the set. Well, this really had to worry Lloyd because if she wrote about what he had done and you know if she observed any of this, he had to 
he, again, he didn't know how much the detectives knew. So th that actually proved to be effective and delivered, I think, one of the real breakthroughs in um, questioning Lloyd. Mark Janney, uh, former college basketball player, a very big, imposing guy, uh, very uh, menacing when he wants to be. Uh, and so if there was a bad cop in the room, it was Mark. But Mark's role went beyond being a bad cop. I mean, Lloyd was constantly lying. Uh, and the other detectives would sort of let him slide with the lies. I mean, most people, when they're caught in a lie, are embarrassed. Uh, Lloyd would never be embarrassed. He would just shift gears and go off in another direction. And, and Dave and Katie generally were not inclined to call him on it, you know, on the obvious lies. Mark, on the other hand, would always sometimes compile long lists saying, now, imagine you are a normal, rational person and, and you are telling me there's this, and then this, and then this, and this. What, what is a normal person going to think? You know, and this was very disturbing to Lloyd because it was all true, and it forced him to confront how badly he was hurting himself as time went by. So, um, To go back to Katie, I think that um, one of the initial mistakes that you describe in the book is that they told Lloyd that Helen was dead. Yeah. And so if, if they hadn't told him that, they would have been able to constantly hold Helen as a potential backstop to right. whatever lies he was telling. And that was the genius of Katie Leggett's invention of the diary, because now they could use Helen against him even though Helen was <laughs> deceased. Right. Um, in, in my experience, I find that um, you get a whole lot more when you're playing a good cop. You're, if, you're, if you don't have the witness that you're talking to up against the wall where they're, they're resisting already because you're confronting them, mm -hmm. um, they need some, co um, they need cajoling. They need somebody to feel like they're in their corner and it makes right. them once you can get them comfortable, I think you are a lot more successful yeah. in getting information. And, and most interrogators will tell you that the best way to get people to talk to you is to be nice to them. However, it helps if there's a bad cop in the other room. And you know what happens in these cases is that it, Lloyd very clearly, over the long haul, preferred talking to Dave because Dave didn't confront him. Dave didn't play on his emotions. Dave basically just sympathized with him. You're really a good guy at heart, you know. I know you didn't really mean, you know, this or that or the other. Tell me, you know, um, and, and eventually, whenever Lloyd did have a moment where he had decided for his own reasons that he was gonna tell them something, he would ask them to bring Dave. If Dave wasn't already there, he'd say, well, bring Dave in here and I'll, I'll tell Dave. So you asked me to take a look at the manuscript when it was pretty far along from the standpoint of a criminal defense lawyer. Right. And predictably, I saw some problems. Yeah. <laughs> so I want to talk a little bit now about some of the constitutional issues that govern um, interrogations. Right. And so the first concept... And, and I, let me just say before you start that you made me seem a lot smarter in this book than I in fact am, because I would not have known a lot of these issues uh, except for Katie's help in, in pointing out things like this. You should probably think twice about this or whatever. So well, it was my pleasure helpful. to do that. Um, so the, the first concept that I want to talk about, the, um, the due process touchstone for a confession is voluntariness. And you measure voluntariness against the degree of coercion that is applied to the confession. Um, so that's why um, Miranda exists. It's a, a Supreme Court case that requires uh, law enforcement to tell someone from whom they expect to elicit an incriminating comment, or maybe not an incriminating comment, that you have the right to remain silent. You're statements can and will be used against you. And um, to satisfy Miranda, it's important that the person that you're speaking with understands and is aware of what their rights are. Mm -hmm. 
So the flip side to that is an immunity agreement where immunity is sort of an exception to Miranda because it's by agreement the parties understand that the statements that are going to be made will not be used against the person making them. Right. And so I, I'd like to usher in the um, immunity agreement, agreement right. that um, the detectives put together for Lloyd Welch before he started spilling his guts. Yeah, the fake immunity agreement. Right. Uh, wherein they essentially told Lloyd that nothing he told them would be used against him unless he told them that he had committed a crime, in which case it would be used against him. <laughs> and they actually drew this up, you know. It's and, in and writing. Lloyd, Lloyd was smart enough to know there was something fishy about this agreement. Uh, but Katie was pointing out to me correctly, you know, that that would be very problematic if they ever took this case to trial because a good defense lawyer would say this is a... What did you call it? A we, we would have moved to suppress the statements. Yeah. <laughs> and the statements were all they had because right. they have no physical evidence at all. So the, only, the case is built entirely on what Lloyd told them. So if, the, if those statements, and this was right in the beginning, so if you could make that case strongly enough, you could, they could lose everything that they had. And, and they, the detectives themselves were not as aware. Well, that was going to be my question, because I thought the immunity agreement was so ridiculous that it had to be a pretext, and it had to have been a means by which they could manipulate him, because at, at times I thought that he understood immunity much better than the detectives did, because each time he made an incriminating statement, he would say, wait a minute, I need more immunity. Right. Whereas the detectives drafted an agreement that provided him absolutely no protection whatsoever. And at one point, Lloyd tried to draft his own. And he probably did a better job. <laughs> <laughs> but this is all part of the uh, game that's played between uh, suspects and police. When they first started talking to Lloyd, they quite legitimately went to speak to him because they thought he might be a witness. And immediately, he began asking for immunity. And their thought was, well, why does he need immunity if he's just a witness? I mean, why does somebody who witnessed something believe that he's going to get in trouble if he tells us what he witnessed, which made him suspect him all the more. But they desperately wanted him to keep talking because he was their only lead in this case. So the, hence, they drew up this agreement, which said basically, you know, we won't use anything you tell us against you assuming that you are just a witness, we're never gonna convict, we're never gonna use, we're never gonna charge you with anything if you're a witness. But if you admit to committing a crime, this agreement has no effect, which you pointed out to me basically was the, was the immunity agreement that was non-immunity. It, it was, non it was <laughs> nonsensical. But I wanna come back to the detective's motives because um, possibly they didn't understand how um, nonsensical this immunity agreement was, but they are supervised and closely working with a prosecutor who has a law license. Right. So what, but, what was the prosecutor's, what was his reaction to what his detectives were doing? And was he involved in it was, as it was ongoing? He was right there, but Pete Feeney is his name, would have been feeling tremendous pressure. And these prosecutors worked very closely with the police and this is the most notorious open criminal case in Montgomery County history. And after 40 years, they finally have a lead. They finally have a potential witness. So the last thing he wants to do, he's driven all the way out to Delaware with these detectives who are very excited about conducting this interrogation, is, uh, is quash their effort. It, he, it's hard for him to say to them, you can't do this. You can't offer him immunity uh, without meaning it, you know, without it being real. So he tried to shade it in such a way that he could keep Lloyd talking while not prohibiting him and the county from going after him for the crime. In, in my view, as a defense lawyer, I think that was pretty risky yeah. um, because I also think that had Lloyd Welch been provided an immunity agreement that made sense, he 
or, um, right, if he had been provided an immunity agreement that made sense, he would have probably inevitably told the same tale in the same fashion. I, I don't think there was anything in his constitution that would have prevented him from but telling his story. But if he'd had a real immunity agreement from the beginning, they couldn't have used any of it, right? That's right. Yeah. So they would have ended up finding the kidnapper and killer of the Lyons sisters, but unable to charge him with a crime. So this is the real world. <laughs> <laughs> so there, there was one other um, aspect of the, the constitutional magnitude of, of the way these um, interrogations proceeded and unfolded. And um, he asked for a lawyer repeatedly all throughout. I think there's about 70 hours of interrogations. And even up until the very, very end, he's still asking for a lawyer. And I think one of the statements was thrown out because he had either asked for a lawyer or said, I don't want to speak anymore. Right. But you have to, if you listen to those statements in context, <laughs> Lloyd was not the poor innocent guy saying, I don't want to talk to you anymore. Get me a lawyer. I need a lawyer. He was using that as a threat to the detectives because he knew the detectives wanted him to keep talking. So instead of saying, I'm not going to talk to you anymore, he would say, I want a lawyer, which any but, but lawyer would have told to him to what, shut up. But a threat to do what, though? Like to stop talking. And he would say, at one point he got up and said, I'm, le I'm done, and he walked to the door, and they would always say to him, fine, you're, you're under no compulsion to talk to us. If you want to leave, you're free to leave. The guards will take you back to prison. And he would get to the door, and then he would stop, and he would turn around, come back, and sit down. So he didn't want to stop talking, but he would use that request for a lawyer to kind of threaten the detectives that he was at, its, at, at the end of his rope, that he was... At some point, he was going to lawyer up, and he was not going to say anything more to them. It was usually at that point that he revealed a new detail exactly. that was incriminating. Right, because it was always when he was completely fed up that he, in fact, it became part of their strategy was to wear him out, to get him um, exasperated. And it was then that he would relent and usually give them something new. And he's gradually unfolding this awful story of what happened to these poor little girls. So ultimately, um, he pled guilty. What did he plead guilty to? Kidnapping and murder. And he was sentenced? To a very long term in Virginia. He's in his early 60s now, so he's got another six years or so to serve in Delaware on his original conviction, and then he'll go to Virginia and so unless he lives to be the oldest man in recorded history, uh, he will spend Never the rest of his out. life in jail. I think society is better off for right. that. <laughs> but, you know, the ironic thing about Lloyd is that if he had never at age 18 showed up to tell a lie, uh, he would, they would have never connected him to this case at all. And then when they show up 30 years later, if he had just shut up, uh, or had, had told them something resembling the, the truth. He actually, on the very first day, told, the com oh, told them a completely different story than the one he had told the police back in 1975, and not knowing that they had a record of what he had told them in 75. So right from the beginning, they could put down his original statement and say, well, why did you tell the police this You know, 30 years ago, and now you're telling us this? So he, by his own mendacity, drew their suspicion constantly, and it just kept getting deeper and deeper. In the book, you say that the crime, Lori Welch's crime reflects the world that made him. Tell us a little bit about his world. Well, you know, the, one of the reviewers uh, uh, of this book called Lloyd's family like a gothic subplot in this book. Um, it's this awful insular, uh, family that came from the hills of, uh, of Western Virginia who uh, lived sort of on the outskirts of normal society in the suburbs of Washington, D.C. And within this family, there was a history, a uh, culture of, of sexual predation of children so that Lloyd had been raped by his father. Um, various, particularly the women in the family, had been attacked by uncles, cousins, Siblings would sexually experiment with each other. 
uh, uncles would rape nieces, uh, and all of the, none of this was ever reported to the police. This was the family that Lloyd came from. And uh, he was an outcast from this family. He was someone that they couldn't stand, so you can imagine, <laughs> you know, where he's coming from. So I think that, you know, you have this very insular, unusual subculture of a family living in, the, in an upscale suburb of Washington, D.C. So there, Lloyd, as a young, as a boy, is surrounded by a world that he is in but he can never be really a part of. He just doesn't fit in. And nothing more epitomized the, um, the world that was around him that he was excluded from than the mall. I mean, the mall was the place which advertised all the big pictures of great families and wonderful things to buy and upscale lifestyle everywhere. And you know you can imagine Lloyd as an outcast from his family, living on the streets of Washington D.C. in in taking whatever drug he can find, you know, scraping along from day to day, walking into something like the Wheaton Plaza Mall and viewing this world that he would have no idea how he would ever enter. It seems to me. So he has described himself, and I think this is one of the things he said about himself that's accurate is that he was a very angry young man. And so you take this culture of sexual perversion, fascination, sexual experimentation with children, and you combine it with this anger toward the world that he can't inhabit. And who are the most precious people in that world that he can't aspire to? The, the children. So for him to turn on and kidnap two little girls, you can almost understand how that came about. And I'm not saying you forgive it, but I don't think Lloyd is someone who just became evil on the spur of the moment. I think he is a product of his family and of the world that he came up in. And, and one of the things that I found um, useful for myself in, in writing this story was coming to some understanding of what happened, because I remember how m just utterly mystified everyone was in 1975 about you know how what had happened, how it could have happened, who would have ever done something like this, and why. Um, this provided finally some answers. Was it anticlimactic to meet him? It, it wasn't for me because I, I mean I had spent so much time watching him. Um, I watched more than 70 hours of him being interrogated, so I felt like I knew him. Um, what it was is surprising, and it always is, to meet someone in person. And this is true if, if you're familiar with a celebrity and you've seen them in movies or maybe you've watched them on TV for a long time and you meet them in person and you get a different sense of them in the first moments that you meet them as a person. For one thing, it's a human being. It's not just an image you know, on a screen. And I think for me, you know, meeting Lloyd, he was somewhat smaller person than I had imagined watching him on screen. Um, had actually kind of a level of personal charm that didn't always come through in what I had watched, which I found kind of icky, knowing <laughs> who he was and what he had done. Um, I think overall, he was less impressive, though, in person than I had imagined he, he might be. He, he basically tried to bully me and threaten me, which was so absurd. Um, he has no sense of the situation. He doesn't have any understanding of what I do and you know, how much leverage he has over me. <laughs> so he's telling me, you can't do this and you can't do that. And it was laughable. Um, so it was kind of ridiculous, really. And I, I found him to be also sort of pathetic for, for that reason. Mm -hmm. You're a great storyteller. <clears throat> Thank you. And your subjects run from matters of international significance, such as Tet or Mogadishu, down to humans in extremis. And I'm thinking not only of this book, but one you wrote years ago called Dr. Dealer yeah. on Larry Lavin, the cocaine dentist. Yeah. 
<laughs> the mainline dentist, uh, I had something to do with the prosecution in those days. Yeah. You, you wrote many years after the events, just as you did with this case. Yeah. And what drew you to that? Was it the crime itself or the aftermath? To the Larry Lavin case? Yes. You know, I, I was, um, you may recall in, I think it was in 1987, those of you who are old enough may remember the Philadelphia Inquirer going on strike. And so we went on strike and I had a family and a mortgage and needed to work. So I took a freelance assignment from Rolling Stone magazine and wrote a story about two cops up in Central Falls, Rhode Island, who had uncovered this big cocaine uh, ring in, in Central Falls. I'd never written about anything like that before, but I got friendly with these two detectives and they said, we have friends in the FBI in Philadelphia who have an even better story. And, uh, and you know, the thing about that was that FBI agents never talk to reporters. I mean, you just, it's like banging your head against the wall. So the idea that these agents would talk to me is what sent me into the Larry Lavin story. For those of you who don't know Larry, I mean, Larry was the convicted of running the largest at the time cocaine ring probably ever uncovered in northeastern United States. He was the uh, main cocaine distributor in the Philadelphia area for a while. Uh, he, his ring was busted and they were all arrested um, and Larry ran away and lived as a fugitive for a few years in Virginia Beach. And the reason those FBI agents would agree to talk to me is they felt if I wrote about Larry uh, that they would, and got it, I was writing for Esquire magazine, it would be a national magazine and the picture would go all over the country and they might find him. Uh, as it happened, they found him before the story ever ran and Larry had gotten wind of the fact that some writer from Esquire was working on a story about him. And Larry, being Larry, uh, could not resist meeting this writer and, <laughs> and telling him his story. So like many of the stories that I end up writing, uh, you know, you fall into them. And you know, the idea that Larry Lavin uh, would sit there and talk my ear off about his criminal enterprise <laughs> over the previous eight years was like a gift from God from a writer, for a writer, so there you have it. You may find this interesting. I'm 30% into the book, and I feel that he's being coerced. Yeah. That's how I'm reading it. You're just a li lily-livered well, liberal. Well, what about <laughs> <laughs> He is being coerced. I don't think he's innocent. I don't, I sort of knew because of publicity that he isn't. But I felt he was coerced, and part of the reason his stories went all over the map was they pushed him all, all over the map. Yeah. That's how I read what you've written. Yeah. Well, I mean, <laughs> I think that's a fair reading of it. But the, you know, it is a dilemma in the sense that you can object to the methods that the police are using. And, and, I'll, and I must say, I mean, when you look at things like waterboarding and, uh, you know, the physical abuse that uh, inmates, uh, have received, and in, 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 even here in Philadelphia, I mean, the Inquirer would write stories about confessions being beaten out of people. Um, we're talking here about making Lloyd feel uncomfortable, uh, making Lloyd fear that he's going to get a longer prison sentence uh, if he doesn't cooperate. So it was a fairly low voltage uh, level, nevertheless effective, though, against him. And given, you know, the crime that he was suspected of and ultimately confessed to, it really does kind of give you, um, makes you wonder, was it, is it justifiable, you know, to use the methods that they used um, to get this out of him? And in fact, uh, you know, the case was adjudicated. Uh, he ended up pleading guilty. And uh, I don't think anyone doubts that he didn't confess to things that he actually did. Um. I just want to add, the case was adjudicated, but when you plead guilty, you waive your appellate rights. So these issues were never explored, and there would right. there's no airing of them except for In, in fact, the, the way they constructed the prosecution was to basically put him in a position because Virginia had the death penalty. Right. And Spared he them. was, they gave him the opportunity to avoid going to trial and potentially facing the death penalty if he would confess, and so he, he confessed. Hi, my name's Bettina Dunn. I grew up in Washington, D.C. That's why I wanted to come in here, what you had to say. I was uh, in grade school when this happened, 
And you're right, this was the biggest thing that ever happened to Montgomery County, Silver Spring area ever. I remember um, my mom refused to let me go to Wheaton Plaza without her after that. And that was the place, like if you were in high school, after high school, after school let out, you would go hang out at the mall or you would go to the, uh, the Mickey D's across the street and hang out. Right. My mom would never let me do that because of the Lion Sisters. She always say, remember the Lion Sisters. <laughs> That's and right. I grew up with this mantra. <laughs> and I You probably think, went anyway, though, didn't you? But I think that, <laughs> well, my mom was a working mom, so she expected me to call when I got home. Yeah. Um, I think that parenting has, I have two daughters now who are grown, and I think that parenting now has completely changed as a result of stories like this. I don't know where else this sort of thing has happened across the country, but I think last year there was a story in Silver Spring in the same neighborhood where this happened, where two kids ages six and 10, their parents allowed them to walk the mile home from the park. And they had big signs around their necks that said, I am not lost, I am not astray, <laughs> yeah. I am an independent person, my parents know where I am, yeah. right? And yeah. they were walking down East West Highway in Silver Spring to go home from some park, and some stupid neighbor saw them and called the child protective, whatever it's called down yeah. there, child protective services, yeah. and the parents got in trouble for neglect because they let their 10-year-old and 6-year-old walk home a mile from the park. Yeah. Nobody nowadays would let their 10-year-old, these children were 10 and 12 when this happened, right. go to the mall by themselves because of these incidents. Parenting exactly. has completely changed. It has. And, and I think, you know, as I said earlier, because there was no internet then and there was no cable TV, this was primarily a regional phenomenon. But as you say, those of us who lived in that area remember this as a real watershed moment. Now, John and Mary Lyon had four kids, Catholic family, living in the suburbs, very similar to the, my own family. Uh, my mother, when I was growing up, would feed us all breakfast and say, get out of here. I don't want to see you again until lunchtime. And the idea was that we could roam freely in our community, in our town, and no one had any fear that anything bad was going to happen to us. So uh, this is one of, of what, in, in fact, have been many cases that have really changed the culture of child rearing, and in fact, I think have created a world where people are far more fearful of something like this happening than they really ought to be, because in fact, these kinds of things are, are so rare. I mean, the, the, a stranger abduction of a child is one of the rarest of crimes in America, and those numbers really haven't changed much over the last 40 or 50 years. And the abduction of two children is so rare that it's almost fair to say that it never happens. But it does, of course, happen. But it's a, it, the equivalent would be worrying about being struck by lightning twice in your front yard. Uh, so I think we've created a, a more of a fearful society by focusing as much attention on these cases as we do. Mark, I know for some time you've been uh, a student of interrogation, if you will, and I know that this book, is, you know, you, a lot of energy into this particular story for all the reasons that you mentioned, but interrogation is something that has interested you for a while and you've written about it in other contexts. One of the things I'm curious about, and this might touch on, a, on the, pre, not the most immediate question, but the one just before that, how different was the dynamic here because he was incarcerated at the time this questioning was going on. And, I, and what I mean in, in my question is, could you talk about what technique, how would the technique have been different were he a viable, solid suspect, but not with the burden of, uh, of potentially elongated incarceration, a guy who could potentially go free, had their, had their technique been had they not had the tools to work with that they did because he was an imprisoned person. Could right. you just w walk us through, w would these detectives have had the skill, were, was this somebody on the outside? How differently might they have approached it right. if, uh, if, for those circumstances? It's a really good question. And you know, I think without any doubt, the fact that he was already in prison gave them an enormous advantage in questioning him, if only because for him to get out of a prison cell and go somewhere else and be interviewed by people who ask him questions in a friendly way and 
getting fast food, which he liked better than the prison commissary food. Uh, and then, you know, up to, he had created a kind of a story about himself in prison that he wasn't locked up for child molestation because in prison, child molesters usually don't fare that well. And so they could threaten him, and in fact, eventually did, uh, holding a press conference announcing him as a person of interest, that he was already locked up for molesting children. This created such a fearful environment for Lloyd in prison that they put him in solitary. They kept him uh, on, in protective custody, which removed him from all of the routines of his incarcerated life, from the work that he had in the kitchen to the normal, you know, uh, the, where he stayed in the prison to the friends that he had in prison. It basically was something that turned his world upside down. So they had tools that they employed to make life very uncomfortable for Lloyd. If he had just been um, uh, a person in, in society who wasn't locked up, I don't think that they would have had those kinds of tools to put pressure on him because they had nothing else. They really had nothing else. And they, you have to read the story to understand the lengths that they went to to try to get something else. You know, they just exhaustive efforts to try to find some clue, some witness, some evidence. And all, all they ended up with was just Lloyd. So it was the fact that he was in prison, I think, that enabled them to um, manipulate him the way they did. I, I want to just highlight something that you said. The threat to name him publicly was something that they used effectively to extract more information. Um, and at one point, I think it was during the lie detector, the polygraph test, um, one of the detectives talked about how unfair that was that yeah. the other detective had actually threatened him with releasing his name publicly and associating him with the case. Yeah. So there were, when that was Katie playing the good cop, you know, saying, you know, that Mark really went too far when he threatened you with that, well, us holding the press conference, he shouldn't have done that, which sent the prosecutor yeah, through the roof because it not, not only had they done it, they were admitting that they had, had done it. Which uh, constitutionally they're required to do. Right. But you know, there is this other aspect to it, and that was that they were, they kept telling Lloyd this from the beginning. They were more interested in finding out what happened than they were in prosecuting anybody for this crime. And so to some extent, you know, they felt justified in manipulating him because ultimately what they really wanted to find out was what actually happened. As, a, as it happens, they ended up finding out a lot, and enough to send him to prison for the rest of his life. When did the parents get back involved with this and, and how did they become involved? And, and was, was that tough with them knowing what was going on or did they not know anything? I think that the police certainly kept John and Mary Lyon informed all along of what they were doing. Uh, as I said, one of their sons is a member of the police department and his friends with the detectives who carried out this investigation. So they were aware, uh, John, since he, John was a disc jockey in Washington when this happened, a fairly well-known figure, and when he retired, he went to work as a uh, counselor for victims in the courthouse who, uh, uh, you know, during criminal trials and whatnot, get, drawing on his own tragedy to help other people. So he was a very much liked admired figure within the law enforcement community there in Montgomery County. So I'm certain that he was, uh, he and Mary both knew exactly what they were doing. Uh, and I know Katie developed a very close relationship with them and kept them informed. I wrote to John and Mary, who I had met years ago, uh, covering the story, and told them what I was doing. This is back when I first started. And they communicated to me through Katie that they didn't want to be involved in my work in writing this book, but that they had no objection to my writing about it because they felt they were, they were grateful to these detectives for the years of effort they had made to try to find answers. Do you have your own theory of what happened? <laughs> well, you know, at the end of the book, uh, I asked each of the detectives to give me their own 
theory, and everyone is different. Um, you know, I think that my theory is that Lloyd kidnapped these girls. Um, he may have uh, done it on his own, or he may have done it with help from his girlfriend then, Helen, who was less of a girlfriend than a slave, basically. She was a drug addict. Uh, she, her, her sisters all said that she was, he would beat her. She was terrified of him. So he may have coerced her into helping him uh, kidnap, because it's hard for me to imagine one person managing even the kidnapping of a 10-year-old girl and a 12-year-old girl. I think he drugged them uh, to keep them from being able to fight back or cry out. I think at some point, he probably raped them. He didn't know what to do. Lloyd not being someone who's carefully planning his next move all the time. I think he probably took them over to his father's house and stuck them in the basement. And at that point, I suspect that his father, who, as I said, had raped Lloyd when he was a kid, probably victimized uh, these girls. Um, and at some point, they were killed in that basement room, uh, cut into pieces. And Lloyd delivered their bodies, he's confessed to doing this, to a bonfire that, uh, on a family property out in West, Western Virginia where their bodies were, were burned on the fire. One of the things that in the very first interview with Lloyd, where he was again being looked at primarily as a witness, the detectives asked him to speculate what he thinks happened to the Lion Girls. And he said, I think they were killed and chopped up and burned. So, I mean, anybody asked to speculate about what happened to two little girls who disappeared might say that they were raped and killed. But who says that they were chopped up and burned? And so the, the, you know, the detectives are saying, that's awfully specific for someone to say. And it turned out to be the truth. <clears throat> Thanks, Mark. Sure, uh, I have a sort of off-the-wall question. Um, what you've created is a portrait of a person with a classic uh, sociopathic personality disorder. Uh, when you were writing the book, researching it, did you look at other similar cases to try to uh, figure that this was a typecast for that kind of personality disorder that has been written about widely for many years? Well, Howard, being a neurologist, would know these things. Uh, I didn't. Uh, you know, I focused very specifically on this case, but I will say that Lloyd became somewhat emblematic for me of an era that we're living in where lies have become commonplace in our public life, in our politics, in our journalism. Uh, Lloyd's capacity to shift his story from one thing to the next with no scintilla of interest in the truth ever. Everything he says is calculated to advance his own scam or his own version of events. Who, do, who else do we know like this? And, and I think it isn't just in our politics, it's in our journalism. I mean, I, it's dismaying to me, having uh, spent many years working at the Philadelphia Inquirer, which was a great newspaper and a great place to work, having, having lived and tried to live up to serious values as a journalist. I mean, really trying to find out the truth, trying to arrive at my own independent understanding of things, and to see a world now where whole networks are devoted to propaganda 24-7, uh, internet sites where, it, I taught for 16 years and I would have to explain to my students the difference between activism uh, and journalism. That, that the, on the one hand, the activist or the propagandist is trying to sell you something, whether it's a product or a candidate or a political ideology or a party, whereas the journalist is just trying to tell you something. And the journalist is genuinely interested, as I was in this case, of understanding how this happened. How did this case come about? How did they get this man who was a compulsive liar, who had every reason in the world not to tell the truth, to somehow reveal what he had done? That was the question that really fascinated me. Given what you uh, described as Lloyd's family background, I'm curious about what, first of all, how many siblings were there in that family? And his 
reluctance about being known publicly as the horrible criminal, how does the, the known story fall onto the siblings? I mean, does anybody even have a, we obviously don't technically have a responsibility to find out what's going on with them. What do you know? I mean, when you have a family that's that sociopathic, you would think that there might be other nasty stuff that they either know about or they need, certainly family therapy. I mean, what, how, do you, how do you handle how do knowing I, that there's this, like, <laughs> how do we as a society, because yeah. there's a lot of stuff yeah. that doesn't come out that you just hear from people that you know, and like the kinds of things that go on in families, and the amount of unaddressed psychic pain that's leading to so much that, I mean, even with, with our president, but I didn't want to go there. But I mean, what, <laughs> what do you know about Lloyd's siblings? Are they now leading so-called normal lives from the outside? They had to go through being questioned about this. Mm -hmm. So I should think it would have been traumatic for them if yeah. they were trying to overcome. Yeah. <laughs> well, believe me, they developed strong interests in them. I interviewed a number of them, not just his siblings, but his uh, uh, cousins, most of whom now, like Lloyd, are elderly. I mean, they're in their 60s, so they're looking back on their childhood and, and, and they've coped with this throughout their lives. Some of them have made um, big adjustments, have entered mainstream society, have good jobs, uh, um, are doing well. Some are in and out of mental hospitals, struggle with addiction, alcoholism. Uh, there's a lot of anger still within that family, accusations going back and forth. Um, you know, it's, it's a sad state of events, you know, and you're right. I mean, people who are raised in these kind of environments suffer for their whole lives. And very often, I presume, act out against other people. And, uh, you know, the, the pattern of being molested as a child and then becoming a molester is a fairly well-established one, I think. Lloyd falls into that pattern himself. So the, one of his cousins, Teddy, who Lloyd, at some point during the investigation, told the police was actually the person who kidnapped and killed the Lion Girls, um, was, it turns out, 11 years old when the Lion Girls were kidnapped. And, but Teddy's whole life story was one of being um, beaten, molested by his father, uh, being kicked out of his home or taken out of his home, and then being picked up by a middle-aged pederast uh, off as he was hitchhiking, who adopted him as his lover for like 10 years from age 13 to 23. And Teddy broke off this relationship with the man, and, but they stayed friends. And he then molested Teddy's sons. Uh, so, I mean, it is just a, there is a culture in that family, as I presume there are in others, although this is, has to be fairly rare, I would think, where this kind of thing goes on. So we're done. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>